Hello, everybody. This is Barry Chase from Chase Lawyers coming to you from my kitchen. And today we're going to talk about whether you need an agent, whether you need a manager, and what the difference might be between those two jobs. So hang out there and we'll be right back with the substance. Today we're going to deal with the various areas where agents and managers uh, get involved in your career. And these areas include modeling and literary work, people who write books, and social media influencers who increasingly are talking to managers about managing their careers. And the two big ones are going to be music and film and TV, where agents and managers have a more traditional role. So that's what we're going to cover in today's uh, Zoom session. At Chase Lawyers, we have clients in a number of different fields that deal with managers or agents or both. Uh, areas that are fairly simple to explain include modeling, where if you look at my uh, uh, Zoom session on how to launch your modeling career, you'll see that uh, it's the agency that really does everything for you. The agency manages your career and an agent at the agency will manage your career. The concept of a manager is really not relevant to the modeling business. In the literary field, there's also no relevance for managers. You'll want to contact an agent, usually in New York, sometimes in Los Angeles or one of the other big cities. And those people maintain constant contact with publishers. Um, and they know what the publishers are looking for and they can hook you up if they're interested in your uh, book that, you'll, uh, that you're able to find them online and send in some samples of, of your writing and find out whether the agent uh, feels that the agent can be of help to you. Um, and by that, I mean the agent will know what publisher may or may not be interested in what you have to offer. And again, there is no real role for anyone called a manager in the literary field. Now, finally, in the emerging field of social media influencers, and particularly in those areas where the influencers uh, have begun to make uh, a lot of money, which usually involves women who are influencers on sites like OnlyFans or whatever, uh, that area is not really involved with anything called an agent. Uh, there are managers who wish to manage the careers of the very successful social media influencers. And they're people who essentially act as the sort of chief executive officer of the influencer's career. Now, the area where there's most confusion, the two areas rather, where there's most confusion are music, where both agents and managers exist and they have their distinct roles, and also film and TV, where again, there are agents and these days, more and more managers of uh, an actor's career, a director's career, a producer's career, what have you. Um, so those areas have both agents and managers, and we're gonna be spending most of our time talking about differences and what those people do, what the agent does, what the manager does in those two areas. Okay. Uh, this is a happy part of uh, this uh, Zoom session because um, you're in, for the, in most cases, you're going to know that you need a manager for a couple of very good reasons and maybe one not so good reason. Uh, you're going to know that you're making enough money so that you need to keep track of your commitments and the revenue that's coming in, make sure that you're actually getting paid uh, either before the fact or after the fact, uh, and in some way, that you can track how you're doing. Uh, if you're making a fair amount of money and you can afford a manager, uh, that's good news. And uh, because your manager is obviously gonna take a certain amount of what you make, and we're gonna talk about that more specifically in both music and in film. Um, and so you don't wanna do that until you've reached a level of success where you're having trouble either managing the money or managing your schedule where you, you, you're passing up opportunities simply because you're not able on your own 
to keep track of the various obligations that you may have committed to. Uh, nothing wrong with that. In fact, it's a good thing because it means that you're so busy that you need someone to sort of organize you. So that's how you know you need a manager. That would also be true in the other fields we're talking about, but less so than in the music field and in the film and TV field. Okay, in the music industry, which is perhaps the most traditional industry to have someone called a manager, uh, it's getting more and more difficult to find a professional manager. And professionalism is quite important here. You need someone who understands business. You need someone who understands deadlines and commitments and can keep your schedule. So managers have traditionally been a necessary part of a musical career. Uh, unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, because the uh, record labels have gone to what's called a 360 agreement, which you can find something about on our YouTube channel, the Chase Lawyers YouTube channel. You can search for that. Um, because the labels have gone to a 360, the labels now have a, uh, a stake in whatever you do aside from just your, your sound recordings and your compositions. They're interested in taking a piece of your live performances, of perhaps your movie roles, if you step up into a movie from your musical career. Um, and for that reason, the labels have sort of injected themselves into many areas where managers used to hold sway. So uh, that now you have a, a tendency for musical professionals like yourself who become successful to ask themselves at some point in the 360 relationship with a label, well, gee, I've got all these people around my live performance trying to make sure that that's a great success and helping me set it up and organize it. What do I need this manager for that I'm paying a percentage to? So managers are sort of an endangered species in the music business. They're still important, but what's most important is that you get someone who's professional, not your best buddy from the block. Um, who may know nothing about music and nothing about business. You need someone who knows enough about music and a lot about business in order to become your manager. So you have to ask around. You have to see who's had success with the manager. Uh, you will have somewhat of a difficult time, but if you ask around with the people at the studio you've been working with, uh, perhaps at uh, your, your uh, producers, et cetera, you'll get some names and when you see those names repeated more than once, you know that's someone you should contact and begin talking to. And the rest is really your own sense of the professionalism of the people you're talking to before you select a manager. Uh, in, the, in the film and TV uh, business, uh, because managers are a more recent phenomenon, that's mostly been an agent-centric uh, uh, line of work. Um, but managers are still useful because they map out the sort of the course of the uh, actor, actresses, what have you, career. One famous story, by the way, uh, those of you who are, who are of a certain age will remember a quarterback for the Dallas Cowboys called Roger Staubach. Now, Staubach was a famous character. He'd been a naval uh, veteran. He'd been a sort of hero. He'd been a great quarterback at the Naval Academy. Uh, and he was a great quarterback for the Dallas Cowboys, uh, arguably the best they've ever had. But somebody let him do an ad, his major first ad, when he got out of the NFL for Rolaids. Now, Rolaids, while a perfectly fine product, is not what you'd call a manly sort of masculine product. It's for people whose stomachs hurt. Uh, it's for indigestion. It was not a wise thing for Roger Staubach to get identified first out of the gate with Rolaids. And many people believe, and this is sort of the scuttlebutt within the industry, that he's never become as famous as Troy Aikman or Tony Romo, whom you see on the air all the time, in part because his first gig, his first gig that his manager let him get into, was for role aids and not something more manly like cars or uh, sports equipment or what have you. So the manager can help your career and the manager can make mistakes for your career. 
Um, uh, but mostly what film and TV people depend upon is someone called an agent in an, in an artistic agency, most of which are in California. There are some in New York, particularly for the live stage industry in New York. Um, but managers, uh, sorry, agents generally are in agencies that are located in, in or around Los Angeles. And the agent is still the person who's the key person for your career in the film and TV industry because the agent puts you into specific uh, auditions and specific roles, uh, whether you're a director, producer, or actor or actress. Um, and so the agent is the one to focus on when it comes to film and TV. Um, so uh, how you find a manager, how you find an agent, uh, agents you can shop for. The problem you're gonna run into is if your career has not generated much of anything in terms of revenue, you're gonna find that the only agents that are willing to take you on are gonna be newbies who may or may not have many uh, contacts, may or may not really be able to help you all that much. On the other hand, you might grow with an agent uh, that's a newbie, and you might have a long and illustrious career uh, with that agent. But um, the more professional, more experienced agents are not going to be interested in you until you've made a certain amount of revenue and a certain amount of prominence in your own career prior to going to an agent. Now, it's difficult to find uh, reputable agents and managers in any field. Uh, for example, in the social media influencer field, the managers have come out of the woodwork because they see that, again, mostly women, uh, some of them are making a lot of money every month uh, on their social media uh, postings, largely on OnlyFans, but on other uh, social media platforms as well. Um, and uh, there will be many more, by the way, that are going to be like OnlyFans because OnlyFans has been so successful and nothing succeeds like success. So you will have a lot of wannabes who get into this. The social media influencers are tough to find in terms of their reputable uh, uh, track record because they are mostly attracted to the money. And what you need to do is to talk to these people and see if anybody is simpatico with you personally, values what you're doing, really admires your postings in any number of ways, uh, and has some motivation to work for you that's more, let's say, spiritual than simply how much money you're making. So uh, you can talk around, you can ask around, if a manager comes and approaches you when you're a social media influencer, you wanna make sure that after the phone call that you have or the Zoom session or what have you, you don't feel like you gotta take a shower. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with my shower test, it means that if you finish an encounter with someone and you feel as if this person has no integrity, uh, is willing to cheat uh, others theoretically, but in fact, uh, if they cheat others, they may cheat you as well. So uh, when you get that kind of a feeling, you should run the other way and definitely not regard this person as someone you wanna do business with. Uh, in the modeling field, uh, it's, it's a little different because again, the agency does everything and you really won't be approached, although the shower test is important uh, in the modeling field as well. Uh, again, I refer you to the uh, video that, that's on the Chase Lawyers YouTube site about launching your modeling career, which has a lot of information about testing out people who may wanna become your agent. Um, so uh, in those areas, the shower test is very valuable. Now in film and TV, uh, you wanna look for someone if you can, who's professional, who has done this. And I think for my own uh, feeling is that you want someone who doesn't have a sort of attitude. Um, if the message you get from, from an agent that you contact because you found them online and they seem to be working in the area that you think you've got some strength in. Um, if what you get is, well, you're lucky to be able to talk to me because I'm an important agent and if you do everything right, I may take you on. That's the kind of attitude you don't want. 
The attitude you do want, again, is someone who values what you've already done, um, who looks at your reel. You're going to have a, a, a sizzle reel of what your roles have been before, what you've directed before, the short films you may have done, uh, what have you. Um, it's, you want someone who really admires and appreciates what you can bring to the table and who wants to be your agent. Uh, not someone who thinks, well, you know, I'll take this person on if I do nothing for them, they don't deserve much, um, which is the attitude one gets from an agent occasionally. Uh, the downside of that, of course, is that the people who've got that attitude, some of them anyway, uh, are people who've had some success and who only want people who've already sort of made it in the industry. Uh, maybe not the A list, but the B plus list. Uh, if you're not there yet, you're going to have to look for someone who sounds professional, who is interested in what you do, for what you do. In other words, not just for the money that he or she can make off of you. Yes, we all have to make a living, but you want someone who appreciates the way you're actually pulling this revenue in and believes in your career in the long term. Uh, now, for music people, an agent is really not someone who manages your career. An agent in the music field is someone who simply books a particular gig for you. In other words, the manager will say, I think we can get you into uh, XYZ Lounge to do a 100 person venue with your act, with your musical act, uh, which is great. But the manager, because of state statutes, which I won't get into because it'll confuse you, uh, usually can't actually make that deal with the venue. Uh, if, if anyone's making deals for you, specific deals with venues for live performances, most state statutes that we're interested in are going to say that that person uh, can't uh, actually um, uh, do uh, commitments for you for live performances. You've got to have a booking agent do that. And there are booking agents who do that. The booking agent will take 10% of what the gross revenue is for your appearance in that live venue. Uh, and you may never work with that booking agent again, or you may. Some people end up with a booking agent that they feel is particularly good. Uh, it is hard to find a lot of professionalism in the uh, music agency business. And most of your time is gonna be spent with someone called a manager. Now the manager in the music business is more or less the CEO of that business, of your, your career. Uh, not to say that you should uh, wall yourself off from what the manager is up to. You have to keep yourself current with that because you may have chosen poorly on the front end about the manager and you have to have rock solid confidence in the integrity and also the competence of the person who is your manager in the music business. Uh, again, too often people just pick their friend from sixth grade um, who's been with them for so long and they trust the honesty of that person. And that's fine. Although honesty sometimes begins to deteriorate when there's enough zeros at the end of the, uh, before on the left side of the uh, decimal point uh, in your career. So you wanna be careful even there, but just because someone has been your buddy uh, since sixth grade and has sort of admired your career doesn't mean that that person is going to be good at the business aspects, which is mainly what you want the manager to handle for you. So uh, be careful about that. You again, uh, have to get your own gut feeling or shower test feeling about uh, the people you're talking to. And you don't want to employ anybody when you come off the encounter and you have that sinking feeling that, well, maybe this person isn't right. Stick, stick around, keep on looking for someone until you find someone that when you get off the phone, you feel, aha, this is someone I could work with. This is someone I have confidence in. This is someone who can be professional in the business sense and also is gonna be honest with me. What does this uh, mysterious manager person actually do for you in your career? Now in music, the first job of a manager usually is to expand your career to the point where you get noticed by one of the major labels. There are really only four of these, Universal, Sony, 
Warner and BMG. So you may not be able to leap immediately into a major label, but what you want to do is climb the ladder from whatever your local label has been, for example, or maybe you've had no label and you've done this on a DIY method. Um, but you want a manager who can bring your work to either a record label or a music publisher or both. Those are separate businesses. You may have seen this on the Chase Lawyers YouTube uh, channel. Just uh, search for Chase Lawyers when you're on YouTube and you'll find a lot of uh, material on the difference between publishing companies which deal with the composer copyright and record labels which deal with the sound recording copyright. Uh, but the manager's first uh, job, and it's, it's a, it may be a long trek, is going to be to get attention for you from one of the majors or from a bigger label that can do more for you than whatever label you're with. Or if you're not with a label, then you can do on a, di a DIY basis. So that's what the manager's first job is. Now, beyond that and before that, the manager is gonna be cultivating relationships with live venues, for example, though the booking for those live venues will be done by a booking agent, which we discussed in the last segment, but the manager is really gonna have the relationship with those venues. And the manager is gonna point the way to, again, the bigger and bigger venues that will lead you to the point where you're maybe playing eventually in front of a thousand or 2000 people at the same time as you are getting popular online and you get noticed by people from larger labels who are basically surfing the web, looking for new artists and new material that they can then recommend to the label that they work with. So that's what managers do for music people. Now in the film and TV industry, it's agents that are going to be uh, dealing with your specific opportunities but the manager is going to try to set out a course for your career growth um, over time. It's a more long-term kind of relationship. Again, you have to have absolute trust in both the professionalism, i.e. competence of your manager, and also certainly of the honesty of your manager. You don't want your manager uh, putting you into a gig uh, or uh, setting something up for you uh, because the manager is going to get a kickback, for example, you want the manager to be working in your interest. This is called a sort of fiduciary relationship. That's a fancy legal word, which uh, your lawyer has with you, but it's, it's for anybody whose interests should be secondary, whose own interests should become secondary to your interests. A fiduciary is someone whose first responsibility is to look out for your interests before his or her own. And that's the kind of person you wanna be able to trust uh, in, in the film industry, as well as in the music industry. Okay, so your career's gotten to the point where you're making money, um, but you'd like to make more money and you'd like to be relieved of some of the hassle of the administrative part of your career. Um, so that's the point at which you should start thinking about uh, looking for someone who can help your career and also the point at which uh, potential managers and agents will be more interested in you because there's actual money coming in. So how do they get paid? How do these people get paid? Now, in, in all these cases, it's going to be a percentage of what you bring in. Um, and sometimes it's off a of gross, sometimes it's off a of net, what have you. But for example, uh, in film and TV, it's typically going to be 10, sometimes 12% for the agent and something like that for your manager. So you're going to be out anywhere from 20 to 25% with these two people, but it's worth it if in fact, they are relieving you of the administrative stuff that is interfering with the time you can uh, otherwise focus on composing music, for example. Um, and uh, so it, it's worth it uh, if, if you have people who can take those burdens off of you. Uh, again, the agent typically will cluster around 10%. The manager in film and TV will be similar. In music, the tradition has been 20% of your gross. 
Now this is important to realize and it's important to realize it's gross because if you have a $10,000 live performance, let's say, the manager will be getting 2,000 off the top. The additional or rather the remaining 8,000 will have to pay everybody else who's involved. And typically, as in normal retail, we figure that if you're taking in 10,000, you're probably spending 5,000 to get there. So your manager is gonna get 2,000 and you're probably only gonna keep around 3,000. So it is a significant commitment. Um, and once you get, of course, more uh, successful, you may find that you're able to uh, drop the manager's commission down to 17 or 15 or what have you. But if you're still sort of new in the business, uh, it's gonna be a 20% deal with most managers. And again, it's 20% off the gross of what you bring in. Um, uh, agents in the music business, uh, they only are gonna be used to book you into particular gigs um, and they take 10% almost, almost always. So you're looking at a 30% hit on those things. Um, and the, the agent will also take it off a of gross. So really your $10,000 gig, you're only gonna have 7,000 left to pay the $5,000 for the people who help to get you there. So you do wanna be careful about these things and you may in fact uh, wanna negotiate even your first deal with a manager down from the 20% of gross to something that's gonna be easier for you to deal with like 15. Um, but that's always gonna be a subject of negotiation. And by the way, for, that, for those kinds of negotiations, you definitely should have a lawyer on your side uh, because the managers and sometimes even agents will try to tell you that they're very familiar with contracts and they are, but their motivation is obviously mixed. Uh, they wanna make as much money as they can while assuring that you make as much money as they can help you make. Uh, so it is a somewhat of a conflict and your lawyer as a definite fiduciary for you, in other words, someone who should put his or her own interests secondary to yours, you should have a lawyer who's negotiating your deal with managers. Uh, it's harder to do with agents because it's mostly a standard, a standard deal. Um, now it models, as we talked about, uh, typically, and as you will see in the uh, modeling uh, uh, online material we have in the Chase Lawyers YouTube site, um, models will start at 20%. If you become tremendously successful, for example, I, I have a model who's a client who's just appeared on the, on the cover of Vogue. Uh, those kinds of people are making enough money so that you can get that 20% step down to 15%. And at some level of unbelievable uh, uh, earnings in the uh, seven or maybe even eight figures, uh, you'll be able to drop that down to 10% for the agency. So th that's only for a very few who are extremely successful. So you start with 20%. That's what you have to figure on. And it is 20% of gross for a modeling agency. Uh, for influencers, generally, that's also 20%. And keep 20% of your gross again. So that if, if you're earning on subscriptions on a social media platform, let's say 50,000, uh, the platform will take 20% of that, which is, which is 10,000 of the 50. Uh, your manager is going to be taking another 20%, which is another 10,000. So you're going to end up with 30%. So again, it's a serious decision on your part, and you really want to know exactly how the manager plans to maximize your career, because that's the reason you need a manager in the social influence, in the social influencer uh, category. And you don't really want to have one unless you know, pretty much you're able to make the judgment up front that the 20% that this uh, agency, this management group or what have you is going to take uh, is going to be more than rewarded by the extra revenue you're gonna pull in because of what they do for you. So those are the guideposts and those are generally what the percentages are. They may vary uh, in an individual case. Certainly if you come to them with a career that's already showing a lot of revenue, five or six figures a month, uh, then you've got a lot of bargaining leverage and you may be able to bargain those percentages down. But those are the standards and you ought to know about them.
Now, let's assume that you found uh, someone who's simpatico with you and wants to be your manager for the right reasons. Um, and uh, you also want to move forward and you believe that this person that you've developed at least a social relationship with will be good from the point of view of business. Uh, the references are good that the person has given you and you're ready to go. Now, there's a couple of things, nevertheless, that you have to be careful about, aside even from the commission, which, as I say, you need a lawyer to negotiate for you. But there are other provisions that are very important in a management deal, uh, particularly in music. Uh, one is the time, the, the term of the agreement, as we call it in the law of the term. How long does this deal going to last? And what's very important in this deal or mostly any other deal that your lawyer negotiates for you is do you have an escape clause? If things go south, and you often know that fairly early, because once in a while, the very nice relationship that you have begins to deteriorate, you begin to, to suspect that your manager is going off the reservation, making side deals, or what have you, um, and the deal goes south. So you need an escape clause, which usually can be put in terms of, well, how much money, how much is my gross revenue gonna be in the first 18 months? You and the manager both have a, an obvious vested interest in maximizing that during the first 18 months. You know, it's your revenue and 20% of it is gonna be kept by the manager. So the, both you and the manager have uh, a, a vested interest in maximizing that. If you don't reach that, that level during the first 18 months, you should be able to get out. Sometimes you can even negotiate this for the first year. And what you need to do in this case is talk to the manager and say, well, what do you think you can pull in uh, for me during the first year? If the number is puny, then I'm not sure you do want to make a deal with that manager. If the manager has got specific plans which make sense to you for getting you to a number that you like, then you should probably make that deal. But even so, you want to make sure you've got the out clause at a year or 18 months in case it all goes south on you. Um, one other very careful th thing you have to be careful about, two other things actually, in the music business, uh, one is the power of attorney that the manager gets. Now the manager will wanna have as broad a power of attorney as possible. Power of attorney means he can do things which bind you. So that if he, sign, he or she signs uh, a contract, you're stuck with it. Uh, unless you want to really foul up your career, because if you don't show up on something where someone has spent a lot of money and time um, uh, setting up a, a gig for you, uh, then that's going to hurt your career and hurt your reputation as, as a dependable uh, artist. So uh, you want to limit that power of attorney and make sure that the manager has to inform you of what he or she is up to, that you get approval rights, over anything which binds you to a long-term, let's say, commitment. Uh, you certainly should do that with your recording deal, your 360 deal. Um, but you also wanna make sure that it's limited and that you, you have to approve anything that's just a big expenditure, um, whatever that may be. If a thousand a month is your limit, uh, then that's what it should be. If $200 a month, is your limit that you'll trust the manager to go off and sign you up for, then uh, that's the limit. So you need to limit the power of attorney probably in dollar terms uh, for any individual gig, you know, is limited to X, Y, Z amount. And for the entire month, the manager can only bind you to, to ABC amount. Uh, finally, and very importantly in the music business, the music business is all about copyright. And you want to be certain that there is something called a sunset clause that your lawyer negotiates for you. And that means that if you have a 20% deal, let's say, that uh, after the three or four years that the manager has you, or maybe six or seven years, though your lawyer should try to cut that back uh, again so that you can renegotiate when you're really successful and get the 20% down to 15 or 12 or what have you. Uh, but leaving that aside for a minute, um, what you want to do is make sure that the manager's 20% doesn't exist for the period, for the entire period of your copyright and what you do. 
because the copyright in what you do is going to be yours or your descendants for your life plus 70 years. Now, if you're a young artist, let's say under 30, and if medical science continues to have the triumphs it, it, it's having in the 21st century, then it may be 150 years uh, that your copyright lasts. Now, you don't want your grandchild to have to pay 20% to this manager because the manager was your manager when you first wrote this hugely important hit single uh, that is still making money 150 years from now. And that can happen. Uh, think of uh, I'm Dreaming of a White Christmas, which was composed in the 1940s and is still making money and probably will still be making another uh, money in another 100 years. Uh, so uh, it, it is important that you look at what's called a sunset clause which is going to say something like, well, the 20, after this, this, uh, the term of this agreement with this manager is over, the manager's um, uh, percentage on anything that comes in because of copyrights that uh, were established during the time of the, of the agreement, the four or five years that you were with the manager, that that goes down to 20, from 20% to 15 in the, in the very first year after the agreement's over. And then it goes to 10 in the next year, and then it goes to five in the third year, and then it's wiped out from the fourth year and on, which means you can get a new manager, for example, without having to pay double the 20% uh, that you would otherwise pay, which would be a big mistake because it would be 40% off your gross, which means you're going to be making less than the two managers because you got to pay the 50% to the other people who are helping you get there. So without getting you too confused, those are the areas you have to be careful about. And it's, it is a really a good reason. I know that I have a vested interest, but it's a good reason in your having a, an experienced uh, music attorney on your side uh, when you negotiate this deal. Now with film and TV, it is less uh, likely that you're going to be able to do much negotiation. Uh, agents, if they take you on, are usually in a leveraged position and it's very hard to negotiate much for them. But even there, there are things about uh, the post-contract uh, uh, period that you should be careful about. There are things about how the agent should be able to put you into a particular role that you may not want. Remember the Roger Staubach example that we talked about earlier, where you don't want to be put in the wrong thing for what your image is because it could really hurt you down the road. So even within the parameters of those commission percentages that we've already talked about and which are pretty much standard, there are items in these contracts that you should have your lawyer focus on and try to help you maximize your own position. So think about having the lawyer uh, involved. Uh, the lawyer may be taking a percentage. Some lawyers do take 10%. Others are working on an hourly basis. But in either of those cases, the lawyer is clearly a fiduciary and therefore has to put your interests before his or hers, um, and therefore is someone you, you should be able to turn to and depend on to make sure you enter the right kind of deal with an agent or a manager. Okay, now we've talked about what managers and to some extent agents actually do. Um, but, of course, uh, we've also talked about how you need an escape clause from these contracts. Now, how do you know whether it's time to escape if you can? Or how do you know whether the manager is actually uh, looking out for you and acting in your best interests? Uh, now, there are certain uh, warning signs. One is you begin to get complaints from third parties that you want to work with. I don't mean just one complaint because that always can be because of a personality clash between your manager and some third party. But if you begin to see a pattern where people that you want to work with are, you know, calling you up or making nasty comments about your manager being so difficult or what have you, that begins to try to tell you something. And you shouldn't uh, close your ears to that kind of stuff. If it becomes a trend, it means that there's something wrong with how the manager is approaching people that you need in your career to help maximize your career, which is what the manager is supposed to be doing for you. 
So keep in mind that once you see a trend in that direction, you've got a problem that you at least have to talk to the manager about. Uh, now, obviously also, if the revenue trends begin to decline, something also is wrong. Now, it may mean that uh, you, know, you need to freshen up your career or what have you, or move in a new direction musically, or even in terms of what your roles are gonna be in a, in a film or a TV career. Um, but that is certainly a warning sign and something you ought to pay attention to and know if the revenue trends are going down. Third, there are things you can observe yourself. For example, the manager is engaging in, uh, let's say, uh, increasingly erratic behavior. Maybe a sign of drug use, maybe a sign of drinking, uh, maybe a sign of other troubles in the manager's personal life or professional and financial life that are causing the manager to act in ways that are inconsistent from one day to the next, um, seem awkward or just uh, sort of inappropriate, uh, whether in front of other people or otherwise, or with you. Um, and uh, you ought to take that as a warning sign as well. And then finally, one thing that sometimes happens, the manager begins to believe that he or she is the act, not you, that he or she is the important one, not you. And this is always a, a, a serious warning sign and does happen in these fields because the manager, after all, is relatively anonymous. When you walk down the street in New York or LA or wherever, if anyone walks in LA, um, when you walk down the street, it's, uh, the, it's you who's gonna get the attention and it's you who deserves the attention because you are the starting gun for everything that the manager makes money on as well. When you see that the manager is beginning to resent that kind of attention to you, and the manager wants to insert him or herself into areas where it's really not appropriate uh, for the manager to be the central figure, that's a warning sign as well. So when you see one or more of these things begin to happen, uh, you realize the relationship is going south and you either have to fix it directly face to face with the manager, give the manager a warning, or like anybody who is the boss, you are the boss of your manager. Uh, and he shouldn't forget that, she shouldn't forget that, and either should you. So uh, those are the warning signs you should worry about. Now, we've covered a number of things in this area. If you have questions about anything that I've said in this uh, Zoom session, or just other questions that I haven't covered, or other questions that you may have, or specific questions about your own career, feel free to give me a call at 305-373-7665, which is my office phone, or you can email me. I check my email uh, incessantly. Uh, you can email me at Barry, B-A-R-R-Y, at Chase Lawyers, Chase like the bank, lawyers with an S, dot com. And I will get back to you within a couple of days unless I'm off uh, celebrating an anniversary of my wife or something like that. And even then I'll probably get back to you in a day or two from wherever I am. So uh, I look forward, I hope you have great success in your career with the help of people like agents and managers who can help you. And I hope that you'll uh, involve your lawyer in the negotiation so that when you have an agreement with these people, um, you will have an agreement that you can both live, live with and that uh, is the best for you. So if you like this video, hit the thumbs up button below and let us know. Also, you can subscribe to the Chase Lawyers YouTube channel for more legal tips for those in the entertainment industry like yourself. And if you have other topics you want us to cover, please let us know in your comments below so that we can help you out in that way too. See you soon.